So today marks 10 months. And if you said to Dr. Whelan and I that we'd be here 10 months later, I, I would have said you're crazy. Uh, but again, it's been a tough, challenging times that we've gone through. And it's been a 10 months of heartache for a lot of people. And we'll get through it working together. But unfortunately, we had two more residents last night die from COVID-19. My prayers and condolences go to the two families. We have a woman in her 50s and a man in his 80s. And we're seeing more and more people, unfortunately, in their 50s. And if you look at the state dashboard at underlying health issues, it could just be diabetes, high blood pressure. I'm not trying to scare anyone. I'm just trying to say the facts. Educate yourself. But again, to lose now 256 families in Albany County, again, my prayers and condolences go out to all the families that lost somebody and to anyone that's lost someone in these difficult times. You know, it's difficult enough to lose a loved one for whatever reason, but more so in this tough times. As of today, we have 14,564 cases of COVID-19 in Albany County. Today, unfortunately, is another record that we hit. 351 positive cases since yesterday. The last time we were this high was January 1 at 346. Our, that brings our five-day average now to 279 positive cases a day. It was 265.4 yesterday. There's currently 3,154 people under mandatory quarantine. Yesterday, that number was 3,119. Of the positive cases, we know 42 had close contact with someone that was positive. 21 are healthcare workers. 287 do not have a clear source of infection at this time. As of today, 43,935 people have now completed quarantine. 12,616 tested positive for the virus and have recovered. Good news. That's an increase of 390 recoveries since yesterday. Unfortunately, and one of the reasons why we're here today is the hospitalizations. We have 15 new hospitalizations overnight. There are currently 155 people in our, in our hospitals. Our high, I believe, was 168 or 164 in that neighborhood. So again, we go up and we go down. And yesterday we had 148 people in the hospital. We have eight patients currently in the ICU. The day before that was nine. Again, we need people to do their part. Continue to educate yourself. Wear your mask, cough into your arm, clean your hands, stay six feet apart, and we'll get through this. Like I said, we have COVID-19 fatigue, the lights at the end of the tunnel. We're almost there, people. We are almost there. We're on like the fourth yard line, getting ready to get into the end zone, and we're close. But it's going to take time. It's going to take, unfortunately, another probably seven and a half months. It's going to take time for the vaccine to roll out. So please bear with us. Our capital region hospitalization bed capacity is roughly around 25% still. ICUs about 19%, a little less somewhere in that neighborhood, and that's alarming. One of the good things is, through all this, we had our, our, our Shaker Place Rehabilitation Nursing Home Center being remodeled and redone and adding on. It was completed last week. So we have a tower two, three, and four floors in our tower that are now vacant, and everyone's in the new part of the nursing home, which is great. So our nursing home residents and facility have completed the separate and have a separate and entrance to our nursing home. So one of the good things is with our floors, one of the partnerships we've been doing, and I do want to thank Dr. Reed from St. Peter's. Uh, I want to thank the State Department of Health, the governor, Andrew Joyce, the county chair, uh, we've worked together on this for a while, but how do we get the patients that no longer really need to be in the hospital uh, but still need treatment and capacity of what we're dealing with? And one of the alarming things that have bothered me is when you look out in California and when you see people in parking garages, you see ambulance circling for half hour to two hours trying to get someone in that hospital. You see what's going on in El Paso, Texas. You go around and you educate yourself Hospitals are at their capacity and they're doing mid-shift hospitals all over. I don't want to have that happen here in the capital region. I don't want that to happen anywhere in this great country of ours, but especially here where we can do our part in working together in a partnership. So working with St. Peter's Healthcare and the eight other regional hospitals, we've come up with a, a solution to the problem. Like I've said to everyone before, you know, 
let's not be part of the problem. Let's figure the solution to the problem and work together so we can take care of the people that are our constituents that live not just here in Ormond County, but that make up the Capital District. And this partnership is going to do that. We have 160 beds that are empty now in our nursing home tower. So I want to make this clear. Our tower has a separate entrance now. Our tower is separated from our current nursing home. We have two separate ventilation systems, so they're not even tied into the new, the new nursing home. This is a separate ventilation, separate c capacity of taking care of people while not interfering with our current nursing home. This will be run by St. Peter's, and I'll, talk, I'll turn it over to Dr. Reed in a second. This is going to be run by St. Peter's. It's going to be staffed by St. Peter's. It's going to be furnished by St. Peter's. Albany County, other than hosting it in our, our, our building, uh, that's our partnership. And that's what partnerships are about, taking care of people. And if this can relieve the patients that should be discharged but can't for other reasons, and I'll, to, I'll let Dr. Reed talk about that, uh, these are ones that aren't really infected, they're not infected, they're not gonna spread the virus, and I can assure the people and the residents at our current nursing home, Shaker Place, separate ventilation, separate entrance, workforce won't co-mix, co workforces will not go on the other side, We've cleaners, food, everything's going to be separated. Uh, it's independently run and it will not touch our current nursing home. So I want you to focus on that. But we need to work together for the hospitals to make sure that they have the tools and resources that they can take care of people. We said this month was going to be difficult and it has been. Our hospitalizations are the highest it's been in 10 months. We're seeing the death rate go up and up every day and positive cases going up, up and every day. So we need to do our part. And again, I wanna thank Governor Cuomo. I wanna thank the Department of Health, uh, Andrew Joyce, the chair, because I made him aware of this, what we were working on, and he was behind it. To everyone involved uh, and to everyone that made this happen, because trust me, that was one of the reasons why I wasn't on the phone call with the superintendents. We've been working on this and we've been working on a solution to the problem. So uh, I do want to talk, turn it over to Dr. Reed to talk about what's going to be going on and how this is going to work to go forward. Dr. Reed. Thank you, County Executive uh, McCoy. Dan, thanks very yeah. much. Um, and thank you for letting me be here today. Um, I guess in the 30 years that I've been practicing medicine uh, and in healthcare administration in this region, I have never seen collaboration in healthcare among the hospital systems and other facilities uh, like I've seen since this pandemic started. Um, we have a regional coalition of about a dozen hospitals, goes all the way up to Adirondack Medical Center in Glens Falls and out west to Nathan Littower and St. Mary's in Amsterdam and so forth, um, that uh, are on the phone together every single day at least twice. Uh, we were on our 7.30 a.m. call this morning. Um, and the, uh, we compare numbers, we compare what happened overnight, who came in, who went out, uh, who's at full capacity for COVID positive patients, uh, whose ICU is at full capacity, who has room uh, to take COVID positive patients. And so through this pandemic, um, this has not been a case of St. Peter's Hospital or Albany Medical Center or Ellis or St. Mary's basically doing uh, their thing for their particular part of the community. It has been an absolutely regional cooperative effort where we do planning for admissions and so forth across the entire region. Um, we know now, I know right now, who can take a COVID positive patient today. And if there's somebody, uh, a hospital that uh, can't because they've reached uh, that magic 85% uh, utilization number, we know exactly where that patient can go within the region. Now that has huge implications about our ability to handle surges and the need for capacity. Uh, it's not one of these things where every single hospital has to be able to handle the surge. It's we as a region handling the surge. And what's terribly interesting about uh, the initiative that Dan and his staff uh, have uh, worked with us on is this regional cooperation now is extended uh, to Albany County. Uh, and uh, this is a very important step for us in handling what we're facing. Um, we uh, probably run right now, uh, it depends on the facility, it depends upon the day, it depends upon whether it's the morning call or the evening call. Uh, this is a very dynamic situation, but we're probably running between 70 to 80 percent of uh, capacity in most of our hospitals right now, some lower, some higher. 
Um, and as you know, once we get to 85%, we get nervous because that's giving us only 15% of wiggle room uh, if the surge uh, really uh, starts rolling. And one thing I've learned, a lesson certainly I've learned during this pandemic is don't try to predict what the number of COVID positive inpatients is going to be tomorrow or next week or the next week, but make sure that you're ready and you have the capacity for whatever comes at us. And uh, that's exactly what we've been doing and why the shaker place alternative now is such an important one to us. Um, back when the pandemic first started, uh, the governor and the commissioner of health said to all the hospitals in New York State, we want you to come up with plans that could increase your capacity in the face of a surge by 50% or more. And we did that. So we had these plans on the shelf after that first surge, uh, you remember back in the spring. Uh, then the second surge came along, this one, and at least for St. Peter's, we're running an inpatient census right now of COVID positive patients about three times what it was in the spring. Um, but we had these surge plans in place. Uh, and basically what these plans said is this particular unit where we're doing something that's going to be converted to a COVID positive uh, uh, floor, we can add those beds. This one will be added. Um, our problem really hasn't been so much beds now, has been staff. That's where uh, the real crux of the problem is. But in our surge planning, we've also included surge planning for staff, redeploying people. Um, for my organization, we have uh, probably 100 uh, uh, office sites around the region, and we can redeploy nurses from uh, offices, uh, physician offices, uh, to acute care, to the hospitals. So we have surge plans at various levels. And as you know, we even have gotten to the point of um, stopping elective surgery. Various steps that we can take, and there are more steps we can take. The issue is for us, you don't want to be doing that planning the morning when that number hits where you can't handle that next COVID positive patient, to Dan's point. That's, that's the point he was making. And so this opportunity to use Shaker Place, although we are not going to have to put patients in that right away tomorrow, uh, we don't know when. Um, it's very important that that arrow be added to our quiver so that as we face this very unpredictable surge time, we know not only do, does each facility uh, within the region have its own local surge plans for increasing bed capacity and staff capacity, but we now have this backstop of Shaker Place where if we get pushed to that wall, um, we're not sitting here worried. We're going to be suddenly overcome and looking at each other and say, what do we do now? We already know what we're going to do. Uh, Shaker Place is being fitted out now. Um, it's going to have, as uh, Dan said, uh, the patients that will be going there are those that, were, that are co still co testing COVID positive uh, but are not infectious. That's a decision that's made clinically, but the CDC has guidelines for that. We follow those guidelines. Uh, those patients probably in the region right now on any given day, the ones that uh, don't need to be in an acute care setting but still test positive for COVID, um, probably run about 50 to 60. Um, at Shaker Place, um, if we were on any given day to open that, um, it, as uh, Dan said, it has the potential of 160 beds. We'd probably do that in stages, 40 beds, and then work our way up. Right now, we don't need to do that. I, I want to say to everybody, um, our current uh, capacity utilization we can handle, um, and we have additional surge plans in the hospitals that, uh, that we can move to uh, should we push up against that 85% number. But that said, as I commented, having this backstop for us is extremely critical because we just don't know what that number is going to be next week or the following week. But it's certainly going to be going up right now. We see the increases that Dan mentioned. Uh, and uh, it is extremely uh, important for us to know uh, that we do have this opportunity should we need to take advantage of it. As I said, we're in the process of fitting it out. Um, it'll be ready to go. Um, these are going to be non-infectious people. Um, it's uh, going to be a completely separate staff, separate ventilation system, as Dan pointed out. Um, and uh, we think this is a very, very safe setting to be doing this in. In fact, it was ideal. We couldn't believe that this really uh, came up, that Dan brought this forward, and we were going to be able to do this uh, and really position us for the future. So, Dan, thanks very much for your, your helping us and, and getting this going. I appreciate it. 
So I do uh, appreciate you and your leadership in St. Peter's for their leadership and community for generations. Um, but it does take a lot of people, and I do want to thank my Deputy County Executive, Dan Lynch, Eugenia, our, our Department of Law, uh, Larry Slackey at the nursing home. But first and foremost, the 172 residents, the residents that call our Shaker Place their home, uh, first and foremost, your safety is the utmost importance of all this. And to the workers, to the over 200 workers there are the same. Uh, we made sure, and it was ideal, like Dr. Reed said, having separate ventilation systems, separate everything. It just, it, it, it all fell in a place like this was supposed to happen. And again, I was not going to have one county resident or one capital district resident or one New Yorker that could come to these hospitals, great hospitals we have up here, uh, and be stuck in a parking lot or be stuck in a tent and find out you lost your loved one that way. And unfortunately, hopefully that never happens. Hopefully we don't get there. Hopefully we do this and we don't have one patient that comes to Shaker Place to the towers. Uh, but we do have the capacity for 160 people and we will be ready. And it helps with elective surgeries because if you remember, and Dr. Reed could say this better than me, when we shut down with elective surgeries and everything else, people that needed back surgery, people that needed to get knee surgeries or joint, whatever it may be, and you can say better than me, um, they suffered. They suffered because they couldn't get this done. So that continues that to move forward as well as everything else. So again, in a partnership with everyone. So thank you to my team. Thank you to Dr. Reed's leadership on this uh, and bringing everyone together and making this happen. Because I got to assure you, there was a lot of papers I had to sign and a lot of legal stuff we had to cross our T's and dot our I's uh, to make sure that you know everyone's protected moving forward. So talking about that, yesterday marked the first day for 1B that opened up. That includes uh, residents over the age of 75, which is our priority. We are identif trying to identify residents over 75. So people that are watching this, listening to this, please, please go on the website, uh, the state's website, sign up for the test. Uh, ours is launching uh, today. I believe it goes out for signups. I'm not sure if it's today or later on um, for our 500 uh, vaccines that we have that we will be running tomorrow. Uh, but we want the 75 year olds. We want the black and brown communities. Uh, we want to get the shots to the most vulnerable people here in Albany County, first and foremost. So please, I know uh, all the essential workers, first responders, teachers, transportation workers, we want to get to you too, but we want to take, take the shot to the arms that have been affecting the most. And if you look at it, it is our population over 75 that unfortunately been falling victim harder to this than anyone else. Uh, please go to the hotline. New York State has a hotline. 1-833-697-4829. Uh, please don't call our health department. Uh, Dr. Whalen, that was one thing we were going back and forth to text today. She's like, please, please don't. My office was overwhelmed. Uh, we're going to be announcing a partnership with Pete Gann Unite Way for this reason. We're getting overwhelmed. I, I was on a conference call with other county executives and county managers from Saratoga and around. We, were, we did a meeting. Thank you, Steve McLaughlin, for setting that up. And uh, we were just talking, frankly, between each other. I said, last night was the first time in 10 months I literally shut my phone off. I couldn't take it anymore. But by, by like 1 o'clock in the morning, from the instant messaging, people emailing me, people I haven't talked to in years. Yes, it was nice to hear from you. Um, but people I knew from my childhood saying, hey, my mom, my dad. I, listen, it's the state's running this. The state's controlling who signs up for it. So please educate yourself. Please, you know, listen, don't bog down the health care facilities. Uh, the pharmacists will be getting it. There'll be a rollout. Pharmacists, your local pharmacists will be handling this too. I don't know how they're going to set it up, but for us, we will have a, a number set up pretty soon. Hopefully you'll announce it today or tomorrow with uh, United Way to ease some of that. Uh, there's no questions my health department can answer on this. Please let them do their epi, let them do their investigations, but it is bogging us down. It bogged my office down yesterday where I was amazed that uh, our call volume just went through the roof. We had people call from New York City looking to get shots up here. They said they would drive the three hours. I'm like, are you kidding me right now? You know, and, and again, we have to prioritize it for the people here. It's about the capital region. Um, and I know they got sites in Westchester and New York City, uh, but when you see people really reaching from New York and other parts uh, of the, you know, this country that have called looking for shots, um, unfortunately, we can only line up people, get them ready. We, that's why I launched that initiative with Mohawk Amblins to say we can take 300 vaccines right now and get them out. Just get us vaccines. It's going to take time, people. You have to be patient. 
you have to be patient. I know everyone wants a shot. I know everyone wants to get it, and that's good because I want to say four or five months ago, no one wanted it. You know, we had 50% of the people didn't want it. Now everyone wants it, and that's a good thing. And the governor was correct when he said, sign up, get your future dates. As the vaccine rolls in and, and we get more, we can get it out quicker. But until that point happens, you know, just be patient. Be patient and uh, wait for your, you know, your, if you're 1A or 1B or 1C, wait for that and, you know, you'll get notified, um, you know, and again, uh, please be patient with all of us. So we need to get 70% of the people with the vaccine. We know that. And that's why I've said this two months ago and I said it to the reporters in this room, you know, you can call me out and I hope I'm wrong. And said this about the Times Union, I hope I'm wrong. I, I, I said, I hope you write the headline county executive was wrong and we opened up by mid January. It's just a world we're in. We're looking September, October before we get to back to normalcy. And mentally, you have to be prepared for that. And I know it's been tough, and it's been a tough 10 months. And I see it with my own kids. I see it with my own family. People are arguing. I'm like, all right, here we go again. Um, again, because it's tough. And little things are setting people off. So please, if you do need an appointment, uh, call Whitney Young. We pay for it if you don't have insurance. 518-465-4771 and you Albany, which looks like they'll be setting up a drive through testing. So please, you know, uh, make your appointments at you Albany by calling 188-364-3065. I know a website went up for you Albany for to get testing done. And, uh, you know, again, please just be patient. I know people are on there. I can't control it. Um, you know, I, I it's going to take time and, you know, the state workers and department of health and everyone's doing a great job. Just bear with them and let them do their job. And trust me, they're working on this around the clock. And thank you to all them that are making this happen. Mental health, please. We set, we established this the second day. It's just not for the adults. It's for the children. It's a different world out there, different issues. Please, by all means, call. Don't be ashamed. You know, there's no reason to, you know, things are different. The world's different. The work force is different. Hospitals are different. You can't see loved ones. You can't get in to see them. It's hard. It's hard, so please call the number. It's available, it's free, seven days a week, 8 a.m. to 5, 518-269-6634. Our 24-hour sexual assault hotline number is always 518-447-7716. And uh, our partnership with United Way and New York State Hotline. Sorry, I did that a little quick. Dr. Reed's time's, by how you bowling, I know he has to get on to other things, and I know you're gonna have more questions for him than me. So please stay safe out there and do the right thing.